Right. Okay, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Sandra's here uh, to really share a very exciting topic with us. Um, she's been a member of the network for quite a while. Um, it's funny, isn't it? We met again recently at Drinks, Sandra and I, and I realised yeah. it had been about eight years. It was so funny to have that moment of recognition again. So it was really lovely yeah. to catch yeah. up at the last face-to-face -face drinks we had in February. And um, today she is here to talk to us really about her topic of passion and research. I mean, she has a PhD in this. It's really exciting. And so she's going to talk to us all about conflict negotiation and taking an interpersonal perspective on things. And so with that, Sandra, I'm going to hand over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And as Amy said, my name is Sandra Pineda Prospere, born in Colombia with a Swedish husband and living in Basel. Yes, it is great to be with you today and uh, to have the opportunity to spend the next hour or so talking about topics that together uh, make such an enormous difference to our social interactions and the results of any organization. Uh, and these topics are the conflict, negotiation, and perspective take. So now I don't think there is any part of an organization or any part of our lives that conflict doesn't affect, whether it is personal conflict with friends, with the family, or conflict at work, be it with your team, with your manager, or with another colleague. Uh, it applies to everything. And if you think about it, having a solid, healthy approach to conflict resolution is probably at the heart of every size of our human achievement. And it always has been since we all want peaceful lives. So we are going to be looking at, the, at a quote from Ronald Reagan. Next slide, please. And the quote says like this, as you can see, open quote. If you can't handle conflict, you can lead. Peace is not absence of conflict. It is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. Here, Ronald Reagan is equating peace um, with the ability to handle conflict and making a leader's must have competence. And surely you agree, so do I, yeah, that this is an important competence to have. Now, this is clearly a gigantic topic. It would take more than 40 minutes to do it justice. So it's my goal today, even though we don't have that long together, to leave you feeling that this was the best 40 minutes you ever spent. That is my goal to add va much value to you as I possibly can uh, in this session. We will cover some tried and tested ideas supported by research, including my own. And when these, the, these ideas are applied, they can really make a difference to our results by positively impacting our relationships and enhancing our work performance. So let us look at the introduction, at the structure of today's, in the next slide, please. Thank you. So here we will be discussing then, as I mentioned, the three topics, conflict, negotiation, and interpersonal perspective taking. And then at the end, we will open up for question and answer session. These three concepts that you see here, they come from my book that I have written with contribution from Professor Roland Reichenbach from Zurich University. He himself is um, author of many books and an expert in the topic of negotiation strategies. So um, today, as mentioned, then we are going to look at the three concepts at a very concise level, and I will work just one characteristic, so the definition of conflict, and then one approach, uh, one characteristic, and that would be uh, how do we respond to conflicts? And in negotiation, we look at strategies, and then um, an interpersonal perspective taking, we look at practical steps, how to deal and practice perspective taking. Excellent. Um, then let us start, shall we? We start with conflicts, thank you. Um, so, good. I have chosen this um, uh, flight, uh, slide because um, conflict is something so real and this picture is, is reflecting what we feel and what we are. So um, I want to encourage us, although this is a presentation lecture with interactive activity um, exercises, uh, let us be ourselves. Also, let us let out um, the, this understanding that conflict is a reality and that we are to be ourselves in order to be able to deal with what we experience when we are having differences with others. Okay, so what is conflict then? 
Conflict encompasses far more than most people initially think. Yes, being unique individuals with particular interests and desires, living in a socially intertwined context, you know, where we work, do business, engage in family life, and many other activities, we need each other to achieve many of our goals. And it is this interdependency in relationships that can trigger disagreements. Conflict develops when two people or more have opposing interests and different needs, express contrary opinions and misunderstand each other. Whatever the conflict is, it can be extremely negative, experienced with unfortunately and even devastating consequences for the relationship. So having said that, we still can link conflict, we can link conflict with hostility between, as I said, two people contending for tangible or intangible assets, be it money or a value um, or power, where the outcome often impacts power balance between the two people that is involved and control over the relationship. So, but conflict can also constitute a route to a solution and betterment of a situation when we know how to do it. So moving to the workplace scenario, just to be more uh, relevant, uh, we bring it back, not yet. So <laughs> to the workplace scenario, um, constitutes, uh, conflict constitutes a significant issue in today's um, conflict management. And um, studies suggest that conflict management um, in the workplace have increased in recent times with no positive counter trends uh, so far inside. More people, uh, moreover, interpersonal conflict at work is associated with anxiety and fatigue, particularly when employees only manage the upsetting issues passively. So one challenge is to manage dispute properly, to mitigate the damaging effects of conflict on collaboration and productivity. Uh, moreover, conflict damages businesses with high costs yearly, and studies have shown that 20 to 40 percent of a manager's working hours were used to manage conflict. Yeah, interesting, huh? Employees on sick leave due to conflict-related stress results in substantial health care costs with parallel reduced organizational productivity and even personal loss. So, in light of the vast and often negative impact conflict exerts at different levels, it becomes evident that learning to address conflicts constructively, constructively can be of great help for any organization and for our own lives. Although often a difficult process, a conflict can indeed become a very productive experience with positive results and improved relationships. We all commonly and instinctively judge conflict as bad, don't we? But it is quite common. And so, but instead we could ask ourselves, how can I deal with this conflict in the best possible light? So let us look then at responses to conflict. Um, there are five of them. And uh, the funny thing is that commonly people uh, say there are two, only two choices to conflict, either to fight or to flight. But in reality, there are many ways to respond to conflict. So today I will share a model that comprises five major tendencies used by people to respond when facing conflict. The tendencies are organized after concern for own gains and concern for the gains of the other. So if you see in the slide, the one who is avoiding and accommodating, um, those two are more interested in pleasing people, in satisfying others than satisfying own needs. And if we look to the other extreme, we see competing and collaborating. Uh, these two types of people are looking to um, satisfy self needs also. So we have also the compromising part. So let us look then to the avoiding approach. What is that? Well, the avoiding approach person shows low concern in both directions for, for himself and also for others, and then just runs away from the conflict. The accommodating a person maintains the relationship at any cost. Um, that means that 
the accommodating person have little concerns for on interest. And that's why you see this accommodating little friend carrying somebody else. So this is the typical person who carries everyone's burdens and the other people's fault. So it would end up surely in burnout or some kind of breakout. It's not advisable either. So um, then we move to the compromising approach. Um, here is a realization, okay, the only way here to solve this problem is just give and take. So let's see how much can I get from this person and let's see how much can I give the person. So it's a kind of a negotiation halfway. And then we, uh, the, competing, uh, the competing men here or women um, want always, they always want to win and will not let anybody overcome and uh, at whatever cost. I will win. That is the approach of the competing. And then the collaborating approach. That is, uh, the collaborating approach is a two, a two win approach in a sense. That it means um, I want to win, but I also want to help the other to win. And it, creates, it shows concern for the other and for all needs. And at the end, it wants to keep the relationship. It doesn't want to lose this uh, relationship. So, um, now I have a question for you, uh, the participants. Um, what do you think is your style? Uh, what is your tendency in any of these um, modes to respond to conflict? Do you have only one approach to conflict? Do you have two or three? Do you apply all of them? Or do you have one very clear um, approach to conflict? So I'm happy to hear your most common approach define your style. So in this case, and your style was accommodating, avoiding. What is the most common of them in your case? You have to know yourself. But as the context between different conflicts may differ widely, which is the case, there are situations where the listed approaches that I have put here in the model could be appropriate. And other moments where one of these approaches could be really counterproductive. So although we may view a collaborating approach, as you see there, as something uh, better or morally justifiable than, for instance, the competing approach, it is here important to know that we don't judge the different approaches from that perspective. Oh, this is good and that one is bad. Not at all. It's very important to know is how do we, the, that the way how we approach a conflict will influence whether a conflict will be half productive or damaging results. Yeah? Um, so, uh, any question? I would like to move to the next part. Sandra, this is Caroline. Can you hear me? Can I ask a question? Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hi, Caroline. Can I any other question? Good, thank you very much then. And then we go to the next session, and that is negotiation. And I'll be starting with a quote from uh, Kennedy, uh, former President Kennedy, open quote. So let us begin a new remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. So the above citation from Kennedy advises us to take a negotiated approach towards conflict and reminds us that fear should not steer our actions. The statements also affirm that a spirit of respect is a sign of strength that we are encouraged to embrace. So here, fear is a fundamental aspect in not wanting to deal with conflict or let it go. Yeah? or accepting a compromise or so. But when we can get a lot more by knowing how to deal with the situation, then it's better to negotiate with a collaborative approach. Good, in this context, so let us consider what is negotiation? Um, if agreements could be reached instantaneously, there would be no need for negotiation in the first place, okay? All of us would be exactly the same person. That's not the case and we don't want to be like that. But since the world is full of competing agendas and parties, knowing they are depending on their opponents, considerably time, efforts, and resources are invested to find mutually agreeable solutions. Negotiation constitutes the most appropriate route for dealing with disagreement, in which parties 
take responsibility and collaborate in dialogue for a mutually satisfactory settlement. It comes as no surprise then that the term negotiation stems from the Latin words neg and otium, that combined literally means no leisure, from which in turn the Latin word negotior means to do business trade. And it's derived, it's derived from that. So negotiations, negotiations are situations in which two or more parties recognize that they have difference of interest and values, different values, and in which they want to, they want or are obliged to seek compromise or um, a collaborative agreement through negotiation. So having said that, then I would like to discuss a story that I will use as an illustration to discuss some strategies when we are negotiating. All of us are looking at a picture and there is an orange. I don't know if one, some of you already know the story, so bear with me, it's very short. So you see an orange there and I have a problem and I would like you to help me solve it. Um, there's only one orange as you see in the picture and there are two sisters and they are fighting over the orange. So what would you suggest them to do? Anybody would like to comment on that? Um, I'm going to suggest, Sandra, that they cut it in half. It and in. it looks like on the chat that someone else is suggesting share it, buy another orange, mm -hmm. share or juice the orange. Okay. So I think let's keep moving. We want to know what the answer is. Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you for the, for the answers and comments. Exactly that's what they did. They cut it in half. That's what these two uh, sisters did. And uh, right, um, according to the propositions from a negotiated perspective, if we want to have win-win approaches, perhaps there is something else that just gets in half. So, confronted with this disagreement over the orange, the two sisters decided then to conciliate, as you suggested, by cutting it in half. One sister uses the peel for a cake, and throws the, juice, throw the juice away. The other sister drinks the juice and throws the pill away. So it is clear that the fight blinded the sisters so that a more profitable win-win over, outcome was overlooked. That is, to give all the juice to one sister and the whole pill to the other. If they would have separated the pill from the juice, the value would have increased for both sisters without being at the expense of the, either one of them. So obviously the best option in the orange illustration was unnoticed, as the parties didn't, didn't take time to dialogue and explain to each other their needs and goals. Does it make sense? Good. Yes, so, thanks Sandra, that was great. Yeah, so we move to the next uh, section with this uh, introductory aspect of um, um, of negotiation and uh, this orange illustration brings us to the so-called integrative and distributive negotiation strategies. Um, what are these distributive negotiation strategies? Distributive negotiation strategies. They revolve around uh, as much as possible, uh, getting, sorry, as much as possible in a what is called zero-zoom game, where each gain for one party exacts a corresponding loss from the, for the other. So you see here that, let's say, the girl is getting 80 and the boy is getting 20. So the more she gets, the less he gets. Yeah? And this is the typical distributive negotiation, the all serious game. So what are characteristics of distributive negotiators? Distributive negotiators. Um, the tendency is to be competitive, to be self-focused, seek on gain on the expense of the other and being highly rational. So the girl is being unemotional. I'm getting my 80, sorry for you, I'm getting my 80%. Okay, good. That is, um, now we move to the what's called integrative negotiation strategies, also called win-win strategies. They imply mutual gains. Okay, as you see in the picture, um, the team is around the table, and they discuss, they make notes, so they are collaborating and they become creative 
And so that is, in, that is implying that we're looking for mutual gains that can result in greater gain for both parties than anticipated, which was the case proposed through the orange um, story. Yeah? If they would have talked about it, then they both would have uh, obtained more from this situation that was uh, conflictive. So characteristics then, I think I've already said, they are collaborative, creative, and they focus on what they have in common. And they distributed focus on what they have in, in the differences. However, warning, in real life, it is often not advisable to choose either integrative or distributive approaches in a negotiation. Indeed, most negotiation situations comprise both integrative and distributive strategies, and that negotiators may switch strategy repeatedly. And we'll look a little bit more now in the next uh, slide. But, um, so I hope it is clear with what is distributed and integrative. And then now we move to the competences that we need to behave in either strategy, yeah? Or to use both in order to have a win-win approach to any type of conflict. So that is called negotiation um, competences. Normally, I would say there are three key negotiation competences. In this case, I will look at the two of them. It's a model based on Manukin, a professor from Harvard. And then the third competency, which is the most crucial, I will deal with that in the last session um, on its own. So, proficient negotiators are not born. They need to develop a set of competences for achieving successful outcomes. In negotiation, some key competencies are listening skills, uh, good questioning, emotions management, relationship building, authentic, authenticity and creativity, and some more. Um, particularly when finding a way to use key interpersonal competences for being collaborative and at the same time defending my own interests and goals, we need the three competencies I already mentioned, but now I will focus in these two, which is empathy and assertiveness. So here, assertiveness, which is the red uh, arrow, is used for advocating um, you don't, sorry, I decided red, <laughs> it's blue. Assertiveness is the blue arrow and is used for advocating your own interests. Whereas empathy is used for identifying the interests of the other. To, uh, it's a tool for understanding the situation and how the other person feels. Um, okay, so that's, the, that's the, how they work together. But warning again, overemphasis on assertiveness can alienate your counterpart or the dispute, not the person that you are having a difficult time with. So if you go to extreme in using only self-assertiveness, it can become a fierce competition and a big fight. However, if you over-empathize, which is the red arrow, then the risk of excessive concessions can increase in the negotiation and you will be the loser. So I propose that empathy, and it's important to be clarified about what empathy is, and then I propose that empathy involves an active and correct perception of the opponent. It helps you understand the opponent. Feeling like her or him, you can understand better. But it doesn't imply that to be empathetic, you have to be sympathetic. Or it doesn't imply either that you have to agree with what your counterpart is saying to you. So how can then empathy and assertiveness be used together by a negotiation? To balance one's own ambitions with those of the opponent, one needs to coordinate. So here is the key word, coordination, to accurately um, uh, look at one's perspectives and those of the opponent. And it is here that uh, per personal, interpersonal perspective taking comes to play, but I will talk about it later interpersonal perspectives, they can help us to coordinate these two situations, assertiveness and empathy when we have a problem. So in sum, 
let me see if I have, uh, yeah, okay, excellent. So in Zoom, I want uh, combining empathy and assertiveness can help both uh, unbalance and accommodating as well as fierce and competitive people, yeah? So if I'm competitive, I have to work a little bit in being empathetic. Or if I am too empathetic, then I have to train and do some workshops and training in self-assertiveness, yeah, to hold the balance. Here, I encourage you to explore your basic negotiation competences. And once you have identified where you are strong and where you are weak, take a next step to become a solid negotiator who is able to stand stronger in your most conflictive situations. So these competencies can and ought to be refined through practice, experience, and reflection through workshops, mastermind groups, and all the kind of trainings that you can find out there. Uh, by doing so, you will reduce stress, save time and money, and achieve your objectives and win. So that was all from me, and I would like to hear any questions concerning the negotiation part. If there is any. Good. So, shall we move? Thank you very much for the questions. I, this is my topic, so I would love to stay here longer, but we, time is running. So let us finish. Um, uh, and it was a good introduction to perspective taking. This is a number one. Um, it's been hidden for so long, but research recently is really putting interpersonal perspective taking forward in organizations and also for our own personal lives. So, but today my main focus is organizational. So perspective taking, let's see what it says here. Uh, open quote, if there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle, as well as from your own. Henry Ford. Good. Henry Ford is the famous founder of Ford Motor Company, a businessman, inventor, and front runner. Share, he's sharing with us his secret. Clearly affirming that perspective taking is the key to open the door of success. Most of us would agree that perspective taking is a common sense action and a good idea, but very few of us do take perspective. What do we do instead? We, will, we, uh, we actually just focus ourselves most of the time and with, of course, suboptimal um, results in the end. So now in this last session, we are completing then the circle. We've been talking about the conflict, negotiation, and our perspective taking, and how important for negotiators uh, to be perspective takers is our discussion right now. So this social competence is central for conflict resolution, good relationships, and collaboration at work particularly. So let us see yeah, the next slide, it's just the explanation, yeah. Explaining the concept uh, of perspective taken, let us take a closer look at the origin of the word perspective. The word is derived from the Latin verb perspicere, meaning to look through, to see clearly which aptly describes what perspective taking is all about. Trying to take and maintain perspective involves the ability to see things in the accurative relation or comparative importance. Conversely, conversely somebody who is perspectiveless exhibits lack of perspective or having no perspective on anything than himself or herself. So let us practice a little bit of uh, perspective taking and look at the next slide. And somebody would tell me quickly, what do you see? <laughs> somebody saw a duck and a, and a, a dog and, and then the second, a rabbit and a rabbit. Okay, okay. A dog and a rabbit. But you didn't see them at, at the same time, huh? Lisa Rose. <laughs> uh, no. I first saw the rabbit and then I looked again and saw the duck. Okay, so duck and a rabbit. Oh, okay, good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good. So um, uh, let us go to the, then this is the simple version. Now you get ready for the more complex version. Thank you very much. What do you see? Old people. 
old people. Good. And guitar player. A guitar player. Good. After after the old people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after the old people, lady in the door, um, and two people looking at each other. Aha, uh -huh. okay, a lady. I thought it was an ear, but you see a lady. Good. <laughs> A medal, where a uh -huh, base, not a medal. Okay, a base. You see a base. Okay, like a chalice. Uh huh. Okay, and like ponchos. Uh, yes, a ponchos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, a bar, yeah, the bars. I didn't. Yeah, it, it took me a while to see that bars. Uh huh. Yes, yes. Anything else? Mm hmm. I lady um, has a very nice earring. Earring. Somebody saw an earring. Did somebody see anything else? The archway. Aha, uh -huh, archway. Yes, that's right. Curtains um, on, from, through the arch, like the curtain. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. okay. As the hair of this old lady. Oh, 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 oh. And then Celia saw a bottle. I thought it was an earring, but somebody else saw a bottle. That is beautiful, it's fascinating. Thank you very much. Different interpretations of the same information. Different perspective of the same picture. Fascinating. Yeah, it is so natural to have different perspectives as seen in the exercise. It is also easy to create distorted perspective of people, things, and situations, and be unaware of it. This is the hard part, that we are unaware. By lacking perspective of, for instance, people in disagreements, we risk creating inaccurate and distorted portrays of them by making unimportant disputes more complex of what they were initially. Or we can miss taking perspective on important conflicts by ignoring them and making things worse. Because sometimes our perspectives are not accurate enough, are not accurate enough, the negotiation process can therefore be hindered until perspectives are logically clarified. So, uh, we, let us look at what perspective taking is. It is about understanding an experience, idea, emotion, or situation from the point of view of another person. The common phrase, to keep things in perspective, indicates the need for discerning what is important, what is not to let things have the right proportion. For example, by taking perspective, a manager can better assess a situation in his team, and after having considered the team's perspective, he is in a better position to find a suitable solution to the crisis. Indeed, in social relations, perspective taking becomes a strong competence for managing problems and building deeper and sustainable relationships in the workplace and in general, our lives, our social lives. Good, now we go then to, I will have life, I confess this, I would like to share with you my favorite perspective taking model in research, but uh, it will take hours. So I skip it and uh, another time we will talk about it. And so we move to Islam, next slide, and then here we will see that perspective taking in practice can be particularly challenging because it requires from us to shift the focus from ourselves to another person. This is not an easy task, especially not in a negotiation with valuable assets at stake, even more difficult in a heated conflict. So even with high ambitions to take perspective, there are pretty faults to be aware of. I make a lot of mistakes also taking perspectives. But let us clarify that perspective taking, what perspective taking is not. Perspective taking is not guessing, it needs confirmation. It's not empathy, it is understanding reasons that the person gives you. It is not agreeing, it is confirming that you have listened to the other person. It is not drawing far-reaching conclusions, it is arriving to well-founded assumptions. And it is not negotiation, but it is a crucial, crucial competence for productive negotiation. Now, thank you very much. We come to our last, um, yeah, almost last, yeah. Um, next last. <laughs> the following six steps aim to help you in the use of perspective taking through a negotiation 
for solving conflicts. So I'll take you quickly um, to the six steps of how to take perspective. I just wanted to give you something more practical. So when you want to take perspective, you have a problem, you want to take perspective, the first things you need to do is clarify what is my problem, yeah? So put yourself in the center, think about what is it that I'm feeling? I'm feeling angry, sad. What are my intentions here in this problem? What are my motivations? And why I am in a struggle with that person? Write everything down. Answer the question, what is my problem? Second, take perspective on the other person. Now you move yourself from the center and put the other person on the center. And think about the potential feelings, the motivations, and thoughts the other person is having, and which needs uh, do this person have concerning the problem you have in common. And answer the question, what might be this person's problem? Write it down. Gain then, as a third step, gain perspective. It means invite for a dialogue where you will share. First, you will listen to the other person. What are their needs? What is the problem? And what is it that the interest they have? Then share, but first, please make sure you hear your counterpart by putting yourself in his shoes. Yeah. Then put yourself now in the spot and tell the other person what is your problem. So you have to answer two questions: What is her problem? What is your problem? Make did I make my problem heard by the other person? So you both hear each other's problem face to face. Then you share a fourth step, you share your perspective. So, um, um, uh, I think I mixed this, the third one is, no, it's, oh yeah, the third one, sorry, I mixed the third and the fourth. The third step is just listen to the other person, focus the other person, um, okay, good. And then, and the fourth, you are expressing your problem, yeah? And you have to make sure that you also express your problem as clearly as possible. Then in the fifth, uh, you exchange what is it that you want the other person to do to solve the problem. And you hear what is the other person wanting from you to do to solve the problem. I need an apology from you. I need to you to work one more hour or two hours. You know, what concretely do you need from the other? This is only a dialogue. Not, not agreement has been reached at all. And then at the end, you decide together how to proceed. Now you know everything about the situation, and you decide, no, I don't see any way out of this situation. I go to a lawyer. Okay? So then you decide a legal approach. Or you say, okay, I don't see a solution. Let us talk to our supervisor. So you decided a mediated approach. Or you choose to do something that is cheaper and much more empowering, negotiate. Yeah, you sit down and say, let us negotiate, let us give it a try. So you sit at the table and begin the process. Yeah, begin the process of talking about a potential solution. Good, this is the end of the talk. I, I will make a summary now and then open to questions. Good. Um, uh, so it is like this what I want to say. An empowered negotiator understands conflict as a normal, inevitable, social phenomenon that can be addressed with confidence and expectation. Negotiation is the preferred method for conflict resolution since negotiation empowers the involved parties to take responsibility for the conflict they created. They choose to engage in collaboration for finding a solution and assume responsibility for the outcome. Interpersonal perspective taking is a crucial competence that enables negotiators to gain understanding about the needs and motives of the opponent in relation to own needs. So I finished there. Why interpersonal perspective taking understanding? Because it helps you to be empathetic and to be self-assertive. It's the, 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 the tool in between. So my inspirational words for you, become an empowered negotiator by understanding conflict, daring to negotiate and learning to take perspective. Have an empowered life. Thank you very much.